2.1 billion. That's a pretty big number. If you counted one number every second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it would take you about 70 years to count to 2.1 billion. 2.1 billion people around the world claim the name of Jesus today. And 2.1 billion is just a fraction of the number of people who have followed Jesus for the last 2,000 years. But this worldwide family of believers began with only a small number of committed individuals who had an encounter with a power larger than themselves. That handful of people went from being faces in the crowd to active parts of a movement that would change the course of humanity forever. Through the Spirit of God, we have the potential for great things. Jesus has empowered each one of us to change the course of history. It's up to us to take on that challenge. The founders of the early church were not anything special on their own. They were ordinary people who encountered an extraordinary power and responded in obedience. That's their origin story. What's yours? You want to know how a, a measles epidemic collapsed the Roman Empire and caused the rapid expansion and growth of Christianity? Stay tuned. That's the point of the whole sermon this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to worship you today. Thanks uh, just for the team and the way they've led us into your presence. We ask now, oh God, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would change our minds, that you would um, shift the way we see ourselves and shift the way we see the world so that we can live and act and be and think and feel more like you. Speak now, O oh God, in Christ's name. People of God together said, amen. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know, we've been going through a series called Origin Story and talking about uh, the ways in which the history of the church uh, early Jesus followers, and even subsequently for the last uh, you know, 20 centuries or whatever, really shape who we are now and our identity as Bayview Glen Church, namely our values and what we kind of hold dear. And the first one we talked about last week was Jesus first. Jesus first in our hearts, Jesus first in our minds, Jesus first in terms of timeline, Jesus first in terms of exaltation and preeminence. And today we're on to value number two, and I wanted to share with you a story uh, that I heard a few years ago when I was in, in Rome. I had the opportunity to travel there and uh, see a bunch of early church history sites. It was really great. Uh, but this story, I think, really encapsulates and, and summarizes this value that we're talking about this morning. So uh, I was on a tour of the catacombs there in Rome. And if you don't know what the catacombs are, the catacombs were actually tombs in the Roman Empire. And Christians, when kind of persecution broke out and they couldn't meet in public, they only could meet in private, and they would run into these tombs and meet in these tombs. They're called the catacombs. And so we're in one of these catacombs and our tour guide explained to us, uh, my wife and I and, and a couple of friends that were with us, um, that Early on in Rome, there was a Spanish man who was the treasurer of the Roman church in the second century. That means he kind of handled all the funds. And he was arrested and brought before the Roman authorities there in the province. And he was told to bring before us all the treasures of the church. Uh, you know, back then, the church really didn't have anything. The Roman church now has a lot of things. But back then, they had squat. So when they said, bring before us the treasures of the church, there really wasn't anything he could bring anyway. But they threatened him, if you don't bring us some money and jewels and gold and whatever else, you are going to meet your fate, which was execution. So uh, the individual who was the treasurer of the Roman church at the time was a little bit sarcastic, and so I really like him. And... And what happened was he, he left that day and, and, and they said 24 hours is the timeline. You got 24 hours. And over 24 hours, he gathered up all the widows and orphans and disabled people and poor people and those who could not fend for themselves and the disenfranchised, the marginalized, the forgotten about. And he gathered all those people and he went back to meet the Roman authorities the next day. And the office that he was in was flooded with people who couldn't fend for themselves. Flooded with the forgotten about. Flooded with the abused. Flooded with the marginalized. And his response was simply this. These are the treasures of the church. 
This is what we value most, is these people. And so his manner of execution was they nailed him in a coffin with a fighting cock, a venomous snake, and an angry dog, and lit it on fire and dropped it into the river. You see, men and women of God, for the last 2,000 years, people have been giving their lives for these values that we're talking about. These aren't new. These aren't fresh. These things that we're talking about that really define who we are, Bayview Glen Church as a community of faith, are very, very old. And people have been defending them with their very lives for a very long time. So here's what we're trying to do in this series is we understand our origin story, uh, the church, the history of the church, and the ways in which the church has succeeded. We'll talk about some ways the church has failed. We'll talk about that. But when the church is really on mission for Jesus and doing what it's called to do in the world, there are these values that we hold dear. And the author of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such so great a cloud of witnesses, in other words, look back at those who came before you. And at that particular time, it was those who predated Christ, who were faithful to God's story even before Jesus came along. But now, 2,000 years later, the great a cloud of witnesses that we're surrounded by are those who have followed Jesus for the last 2,000 years. We're surrounded by that cloud of of witnesses. It's their story. It's their witness. It's their shoulders that we stand upon. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, do two things. Lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. Get rid of that stuff such that you can run the race with endurance that is set before you. And this is the goal of the series, that we would understand who those witnesses were. Not just in the first couple of centuries, but for the last 20 centuries. And so here's what I want to do today. I want to tell you a couple of stories about the growth of the church in those first few centuries. I want to tell you a couple of stories about the ways in which this value that we're talking about today radically changed the course of human history, radically changed the church, and allowed the church to radically change the world around them. And I, and I want you to hear these stories, and my hope is that you would feel inspired, exhorted, motivated, changed to walk out of these doors and live out this value. In his book uh, entitled The History of or The Rise of Christianity, Rodney Stark points out that in 33 AD there were about 100 Christ followers in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, just 100 people tucked away in this upper room, afraid of the Roman authorities and afraid of the religious authorities who had just killed their king and lord, and they were probably afraid, rightly afraid, of what was going to happen to them. And so uh, by 70 AD, though the church had expanded just a little bit, uh, the apostles were gone, most of them anyway, especially the big three. James the Just, the brother of Jesus, was killed in Jerusalem. He was thrown from the top of the temple. We talked about that last week. Peter was crucified upside down. And Paul, who was on missionary journeys all over the Roman world, was beheaded all within about five years of one another in the 60s, not the 1960s, like Hey, man, not, not those 60s, the 60s, 60s, right? The no, no numbers on the front, 60s, 60s. They were gone by the time 70 AD rolled around. Second thing that happened was that the, the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed. Now, that had a huge impact on Judaism, but it also had a huge impact on Christianity because as second temple worship, the second kind of version of the temple, as, the, as uh, that worship began to crumble and, and, and the ties between Christianity and Judaism began to sever, Christianity became a religio illicita, that is an illicit or an illegal religion in the Roman Empire, rather than being a sect that, uh, that existed under the protective umbrella of Judaism. Because that protective umbrella began to fall apart, and the destruction of the temple was a big part of that. And so Judy, or, uh, Christianity became an illegal religion in the Roman Empire. The third thing that happened is that the persecution of the church was really widespread by 70 AD. Nero had come to power and lots of stuff was happening and Christianity was being persecuted. So, so here's the deal. We should not be sitting here. I mean, Christianity should have been obliterated by 70 AD. Like 100 followers from this like random Galilean messianic figure and listen, listen, folks, here's the wild thing. You know that Jesus wasn't the only messianic figure in first century Palestine? There were lots of folks that stood up and said, I'm the Messiah, I'm the chosen one of God, I've come to redeem the world. And they would get a couple of followers or 100 or 200 followers, and upon that person's death, the movement would fizzle out. 
Or maybe it was even before their death. Maybe they say, hey, I'm the Messiah and all that stuff. And then they start living with the person and they're like, you're not the Messiah, right? And then the thing would fizzle out. But here we are 2,000 years later and this obscure movement now claims 2.1 billion followers over the course or on the planet today and, and, and many, many more, exponentially more over the last 2,000 years. From this, from this, from 100 people with that, how in the world did that happen? How in the world did that happen? And the reality is the way that it happened was because each and every individual, Christians throughout the ages, have adopted this core value that they saw in the life of Jesus. You can drop that slide down. They had dropped, adopted this core value that they saw in the life of Jesus that each individual is extraordinarily valuable. This is the reason the church still exists, not because of its ministry programs, not because of its organization, not because of resources, but because each individual within the church said that that person is extraordinarily valuable in the eyes of God, one individual at a time. That wasn't the case in the Roman Empire. This was an anomaly, Christianity was. Because at that time in the Roman Empire, if you had a baby in your house and you didn't want them, you just left them out on the street for dead. Wild animals come pick them up. Or, or if, you had a, if you had a spouse that you didn't want anymore, you could just say, you're out, and they'd be gone. And women were considered second-class citizens. Slaves were considered chattel at best. This was not the case in the Roman Empire. And then a man named Jesus comes along, and he starts to treat each one of those people with extraordinary dignity. He starts to love people well, no matter who they are. The woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, prostitutes, tax collectors, Zacchaeus, who was a wee little man with a wee little self-esteem. So, so <laughs> I like saying we. Uh, so we... That Zacchaeus climbed up in a tree in order to escape the sight of Jesus. And Jesus looked up at him and said, Zacchaeus, come down because I want to eat with you. You see, Jesus lived out these values and he taught his disciples to do the same. I think it's best summarized in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus talks about the end of days when all is said and done. And the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And why? Keep going. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And those who he's speaking to said, I don't remember that. When is it that we saw you hungry and fed you and thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you? I don't remember that, Jesus. When were you naked and we clothed you? I would have definitely remembered that. And when did you see you sick or in prison and visit you? When did that happen? Jesus responds to them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. You see the extraordinary value that Jesus placed on each individual life. So then when he died and it was ascended into heaven to the right hand of the Father and he passed the torch to the church, the church just began to live out these values in their regular patterns of behavior. Here are a couple of stories as to how that happened. One of the first mass conversions that happened in Acts chapter 2, thousands of people came to Christ. At the end of Acts chapter 2, Luke describes the early church. He says they're dedicating each, uh, the, their, themselves to God's word and prayer. They're in fellowship. They're meeting in the temple. They're meeting in homes, and they were selling goods, their own goods, uh, and possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all, as many had need. Now, lots of times we look at that, and we read that, and we think, yes, it was cool, because Christian brothers and sisters were selling stuff and giving it to other Christian brothers and sisters who had need. That's awesome, and I love it. It's great, but it's not, it's not an accurate uh, interpretation of the passage. Watch this word right here. All. Distributing the proceeds to all. And even in the context of that passage, it was not just Christian brothers and sisters that they were taking care of. It was those outside the community of faith. And if they had a need, I would sell my possessions in order to give to that person. See, see it's, it's placing radical and extraordinary value on each and every human life. 
Same thing happens in Acts chapter three. Watch this, love this. Peter and John are going into the temple at the hour of prayer. And a man who's lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Stop there. This man is lame, he can't walk, and he's been there for a very, very, very long time. And all he does every day is look at the ground and face the ground and say, alms for the poor, alms for the poor, please take care of me. I have no way to work, I have no way to provide for myself. Unless you give me money, I'm not gonna be able to feed myself or my family. Now, let me ask you a question. The last time you walked by somebody downtown who was doing that, what'd you do? What about the last time you got off the freeway and, and somebody was doing that? What'd you do? I know what I did the last time I saw somebody getting off the freeway and they were begging for money. I gave them five bucks because it happened this week and this passage was on my mind. But before that, you do the same thing I do, which is fiddle with the radio that isn't there. Make sure your sunglasses are on so you don't have to look them in the eye, right? You're like, oh, I'm distracted by my children. It's like, you don't have any kids in the back seat. Like, oh, I'm distracted by something, and I, do. I never come to a complete stop, right? Watch what Peter and John do. Watch this. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. Peter directed his gaze at him as John did and said, look at us. Stop looking at the ground and begging, friend. You look me in the eye because you're valuable to me. You're valuable to God. What Peter and John would eventually say is silver and gold I do not have. And they were right. They had nothing. But what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus, the son of God. So stand up and walk. And he did. But it's not so much about the miracle of this individual standing up and walking. It's about them looking at him and meeting him where he's at and saying, you are valuable to God. This is why when Jesus healed lepers, he didn't just say, healed. He touched them. Why? Because many of them hadn't been touched in years. To, to, to communicate, you are extraordinarily valuable to God. Same thing happens in Acts chapter six. Now, this is not just a story of personal action. Now the church is organizing itself around this value. Watch. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, that's the Greek speaking uh, Christians, arose against the Hebrews, that's the Hebrew speaking Christians, Jewish converts to Christianity, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Hey, your old ladies are getting more money than our old ladies. And then there was a fight. That's essentially what's happening, okay? Keep going. 12 summoned the full number of disciples and said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Look, we're focused on scripture and prayer and teaching the word of God uh, to, 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 those who, to, to those who are part of the church. So what are we gonna do? Pick from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom who we will appoint to this duty. We wanna make sure that widows who have no way to care for themselves in that part of the world, right? In that time and place. There was no retirement. There was no pension plan. There was no social services. There wasn't any of that stuff. So if you were a widow and you had no husband to take care of you and you're older, you were in deep yogurt. And the church organized itself around saying you are valuable to God, so we are going to change the way we act and behave. We are going to systematically organize ourselves such that you are cared for. And watch what Luke tells us. A couple verses later, he tells us, here's the result. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. The church began to grow. Why? Because each individual was extraordinarily valuable in the eyes of God, and the church acted that way. Now, this, 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 I think, is funny. The, the plague is not funny, but, but there's, there's some funny parts here. Stick with me. I have a weird sense of humor. Okay, then the plague of Galen showed up in 165 AD. This is also called the Antonine Plague. You might have heard it called the Antonine Plague, but it, it's called the Plague of Galen as well. The reason it's called the Plague of Galen is because this guy, Galen, was a Roman doctor in the city of Rome during the Plague of Galen. And they named it after him because when 2,000 people a day were dying in Rome, Galen said, well, I'm going to the cottage. He did. He was a physician. He was a doctor. Supposed to be taking care of people. And he just left Rome. I think he had uh, something in the Muskoka somewhere. I'm not quite sure, but it was outside of Rome, right? And he left. He ran away. The plague of Galen was actually smallpox, and it was killing people all over Rome. 
I mean, it was absolutely threatening to obliterate. And all these Roman priests, all these people who were rendering social services, all these nurses and doctors, all ran out of Rome. And people had nowhere to go to care for them. They had no way to get out of Rome. And so this disease, smallpox, or the Antonine Plague, began to spread all over the Roman Empire such that, like I said, 2,000 people a day were dying. Can you imagine that? In, 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 what if it happened in the GTA? 2,000 people a day. And while everyone else was running out of Rome, Christians ran to Rome. Why? To care for those who were sick and dying. And, and now modern science will tell us that you can decrease the mortality rate of smallpox by two-thirds just with simple nursing care. Food and water, changing bed sheets, things like that. That's what the Christians did, nursed people back to health, and then they converted to Christianity. He was like, hey, you're the only person that cared for me. I like this value. Now I'm alive because of you, and they converted. And when people did not make it through smallpox, Christians would sit by their bed and hold their hands while they died so that they could die with dignity. Why? Because they were extraordinarily valuable in the eyes of God. And when they died and they could not pay for a funeral for themselves, Christians would pool their money to pay for funerals, not just Christians, but pagans as well. Uh, one of the church leaders in Rome at the time, a guy named Tertullian, writes this. He says, it's our care for the helpless, our practice of loving kindness that brands us, sets us apart, makes us different in the eyes of many of our opponents. Only look, they say, look how they love one another. And people began to, to convert to Christianity en masse because of the way Christians valued each individual. The Cyprian plague rolled around in the middle of the third century. This one was even worse. Looking back now, based on the symptoms of the Cyprian plague, we know that it was measles. Have you guys heard of the measles thing that's going around now? Yeah, like... There's like two confirmed cases in Ontario or something like that. There may be more than that now, whatever. There were 5,000 people a day dying of measles in Rome in the middle of the third century. 5,000 people. A historian actually writes this, a historian at the University of Oklahoma. You'll see his name here in a minute. And he talks about the ways in which this measles epidemic completely collapsed the Roman Empire. He said, after the Cyprian plague, watch this, the history of the Roman Empire is a confusing tangle of violent failures. Ugh. The structural integrity of the imperial machine burst apart. The frontier system crumbled. The collapse of legitimacy invited one usurper after another to try for the throne. The empire fragmented, keep going, and the only dramatic success of later emperors in putting the pieces back together prevented this movement from being the final act of Roman imperial history. Essentially, Kyle Harper is arguing this. It, it was just over. It was, it was just over. The Roman empire was over, was done. It collapsed here, and there were uh, little efforts to save it, small things to save it, but, but the damage had been done after the Cyprian plague. But Al, uh, Adolf Harnack, who was a, a church historian in the early 20th century, writes that during the Cyprian plague, Christianity grew with inconceivable rapidity and experienced astonishing expansion. Why? Well, the Cyprian plague gets its name from a man named Cyprian. He was a leader of the church in North Africa. And during the third century, when the Cyprian plague or measles or whatever this disease was that people didn't even know about, broke out all over the Roman Empire, Cyprian gathered all the people of the church up. He gathered all the Christians up and all the people in his congregation. And he said, nobody's going anywhere. We're taking care of sick people because that's what we do. You know Why? Because that's what Jesus did. And watch this. This is Cyprian's biographer, released a biography of the life of Cyprian just a couple years after his death. It says, the people being assembled together, Cyprian, first of all, urges on them the benefits of mercy. He said, make sure you're merciful to people. Make sure you're gracious to people. Each individual has extraordinary value in the eyes of God. Then he proceeds to add, there's nothing remarkable in cherishing merely our own people with the due attentions of love. But that one might become perfect who should, 
do something more than heathen men or publicans, one who, overcoming evil with good and practicing a merciful kindness like that of God, should love his enemies as well. Thus, watch, the good was done to all men, not merely to the household of faith. Christians in Rome, Christians in Carthage, Christians in Athens and in Antioch, all over the Roman Empire, ran to the urban centers because that's where the sick people were to care for them. And, and Cyprian's counterpart, Cyprian's counterpart, uh, uh, Dionysus in, in uh, Alexandria, writes this, that many in nursing and curing others transferred death to themselves and died in their stead. In caring for somebody with measles, they contracted it and died. The best of our brothers and sisters lost their lives in this manner. A number of presbyters, deacons, and laymen winning high commendation so that their death in this form, the result of great piety and strong faith, seems in every way the equal of martyrdom. Here's what I'm telling you about the first few centuries of the church. When others ran from pain, pain socially, pain individually, pain culturally, pain medically, when there was a smallpox epidemic, when there was a measles epidemic, orphans who didn't have any place to go, the disabled, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, any time people saw pain throughout the first few centuries of the Roman Empire, they ran and did not walk away from pain. Everybody was running from pain and Christians were running towards it. Why? You ask yourself, WWJD? Because that's what Jesus would do. And watch, Rodney Stark in his book, it's called The Rise of Christianity. How a, I'm going to tell you the whole title just because it's a mouthful. How the obscure marginal Jesus movement became the dominant religious force in the Western world. It's kind of a mouthful. We'll just call it the rise of Christianity. That's, he, Rodney Stark argues that from 33 AD, when there were 100 Christ followers, to 350 AD, there were 33 million. More than half of the Roman Empire was a Christian by the middle of the fourth century. Because, because Christians valued individuals. This is your history, men and women of faith. This is my history. These are the great cloud of witnesses that we are surrounded by. Those who gave their very lives because each individual was extraordinarily valuable in the eyes of God. And it didn't stop in those first few centuries. I want to tell you about a man named George Mueller. George Mueller is up here on the screen. He was obviously a male model. <laughs> this, is a, this is the worst part. Go home and Google George Mueller and then click images. This is the best he looks. This, it, it only goes downhill from here. And I apologize for the image quality, but George Mueller would probably thank me. You know, We're just glad that he was a godly man because that's all he had going for him. George Mueller uh, was a pastor in the 19th century in London, England. And uh, when he went to his church, he found out the very first day that they were renting pews out to rich people. So, so people would pay like a monthly rate in order to have their seat saved. So just in case they weren't on time, they would still have a place to sit. Just for a minute here. Baby Glenn Church, I, I want to explain something to you. This concept of being on time. Here's what that is. It's when there's like a start time for something, and then you're there when the thing starts. So I know that that's an unfamiliar concept to most of you, Okay. Apparently it was in the 19th century as well. So people paid to rent out pews so their seats were safe, right? So George Mueller shows up day one and he's like, we're not doing that anymore because that elevates rich people above poor people and everybody has dignity and value in the eyes of God so we're not gonna set people off, or we're not gonna create that kind of disparity. And the church says to George Mueller, then we can't pay you. George Mueller said, okay, great, that's fine. I'm not here to make a dollar. I'm here to minister to the people of God and communicate that every individual has value. I don't need that money. You know, and I read this story and I thought, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that I could say that with Mueller, right? Like, I, I don't know that, that I could say, I don't know that I have the kind of faith. I don't, it's, it would be scary for me, I guess. 
to say, hey, Bayview Glen Church, like we're not gonna rent out seats anymore to people. And people say, look, okay, then we can't pay you a salary that I would go, okay, great. I would say, well, then I'll find another job. But you know what? It's, it's this kind of witness that is part of that cloud that tells us that this type of extraordinary faith is possible. It's absolutely possible. That's why the author of Hebrews says, you're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Look back and see who came before you and what they gave in order to live out the values of the kingdom. And George Mueller was one of them. George Mueller eventually was walking around London, England, and he saw orphans all over the place. So he started an orphanage. Like 10,000 orphan kids came in and out of that orphanage and cared for and fed and clothed because of George Mueller's efforts. Why? Because every individual, no matter who they are, has extraordinary value in the eyes of God. There's countless stories about George Mueller acting in crazy faith like he did when he said, I'll just decline a salary if that's what we're going to do. And, and, and it would get to be the night and the kids wouldn't have anything to eat and they wouldn't have bed sheets and they wouldn't have heat or whatever. And George Mueller wouldn't make a call. He wouldn't write a letter. All he would do is pray, oh God, please provide food and then knock, knock, knock at the door. And somebody would be there with a truckload of food. Oh God, it's cold tonight and we don't have blankets and knock, knock, knock at the door. And somebody would be there and go, hey, I don't know what's happening, but I feel like God wants me to drop off a couple hundred blankets to you. I mean, it's just over and over and over in George Mueller's diary. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I don't, I, I don't know if I have that kind of faith. Like if, if, if my kids need food, you know what I do? I go to Longo's. But George Mueller just prayed. And he wrote in his diary after the fact that I love this, watch. He said, every child of God is not called by the Lord to establish schools and orphan houses and to trust in the Lord for means for them. Woo! <laughs> I'm off the hook. Yet, Mueller writes, there is no reason why you may not experience far more abundantly than we do now. His willingness to answer the prayers of his children. Men and women of God, we need to be praying prayers of faith, but not like, oh God, give me a new Porsche Carrera. But, oh God, would you open doors of opportunity for me to speak life and hope and value into every individual that I come into contact with? This value that's been deeply held by the church for 2,000 years drives us to do extraordinary things and the Spirit empowers us in extraordinary ways and changes ordinary people into extraordinary, supernatural when we hold deeply to the values that Jesus did. I was reading a story uh, to my daughter last night. She gets to pick two books every night. She picked last night the story of Rosa Parks. It's near and dear to my heart because uh, when Kaya asked for it last night, she said, I want the one about the lady on the bus who has the same color of skin as me. Rosa Parks sat on a bus in 1955 and launched the Montgomery bus boycott because she wouldn't give up her seat for a white man. In 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested in Montgomery because he was a part of a nonviolent protest trying to obliterate segregation and racism and Jim Crow laws in the southern United States. Martin Luther King did not do this because he liked folks. He, he didn't do this because he, he was bored and didn't have much else to do. He did it because he was a Christ follower. And he talks about in his letter from Birmingham jail the ways in which he values each individual, each individual life and others more than himself. And he names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel and those who came before him. He names that great cloud of witnesses that we are now a part of, whose shadow we stand in, the baton that we've been handed. He names those in his letter from Birmingham Jail. Look what Martin Luther King says. He says, an individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. You're not living until you start to value other people above yourself. You're not living until you start to sacrifice so that someone else could know that they are extraordinarily valuable in the eyes of God. And it's not just the first and second, third centuries. It's not just the 19th century with George Mueller. It's not just the 20th century with Martin Luther King. It's the 21st century right here at Baby Glen Church. I see this happening all the 
time, not just in broad, like society changing kind of ways, but in one-on-one individual kind of ways. There's an individual at our church who started a ministry called Safe Families. Safe Families take kids into the Uh, into care, into homes, Christian foster care, so that parents can get stuff sorted out and eventually place those children back into homes. They endeavor to replace the foster care system in Ontario. And if you've done any research, the foster care system in Ontario stinks. Bad. And it's not because people are bad people, it's just because that's a bad problem, isn't it? And it's a really difficult way to solve it. And Safe Families comes along and they say, we value each individual in an extraordinary way. Even the little five-year-old and seven-year-old and 18-month-old who can't fend for themselves, who really have nothing to bring to the table in terms of talent, skill, or ability. We want to come alongside the orphan and those who, 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 who cannot give anything back and give to them sacrificially. Men and women of God, I would just encourage you, you may even feel called to be one of those families that accept kids into your home, I would encourage you today to call safe families. Just Google them when you get home. I, I saw an individual here on Easter Sunday. It was a fantastic picture. Uh, this, this man is part of our guest services team here. He's an usher and a greeter. You see him each and every Sunday. He came to Christ here about four or five years ago on a Good Friday and left uh, substance abuse behind and left a whole lot of other stuff behind and gave his life to Jesus and started walking in the way of Jesus. On Easter Sunday, we had a bunch of folks join us from a seniors care facility, and one of those individuals uh, had expected to attend a different church that day, but when they got there, the service times were off, and they didn't quite know, you know, kind of when things were starting and ending, so they said, oh, we'll just find the closest thing, so they came to Bayview Glen. So by the time that individual got here, wheelchair-bound in her 90s and a little bit confused as to what was happening that morning, she was kind of discombobulated, to say the very least, and, and distressed. And I saw this man as part of our guest services team, see that need and do just what Peter and John did and said, look in my eyes. And because she was in a wheelchair and she couldn't lift her head, she couldn't do it. So I saw him on that hard granite or whatever marble stuff out in our foyer, kneel down like this in front of her and look in her eyes and value her as an individual. Somebody who doesn't bring anything to the table, culturally speaking. Men and women of God, it doesn't take that much. It doesn't take you starting an organization. Maybe it will. Maybe God is calling you to that. But it's just simply valuing each and every individual. And this has been the backbone of God's church for 2,000 years. You may know that by 2030, Baby Glen desires to be a family of 6,000 disciples. We desire to grow so that more and more people walk in the way of Jesus and bring the kingdom here as it is in heaven. That's what we endeavor to do. And it's not going to be done by mass conversions where I get up here and preach and everybody goes, oh yeah, we're gonna repent and believe. It's going to happen when each individual knows that they are valued in the eyes of God. So our first value is Jesus first, and our second, here's how we're gonna articulate this at Baby Glen, is that everybody's somebody. Everybody's somebody. Everybody who walks through these doors is a somebody who can find belonging here, is a somebody who can contribute to the kingdom, is a somebody who can give back to the community. Everybody has dignity. Everybody has value. No matter where they are in age, no matter where they are in gender, no matter where they are in terms of religious background, we stand on the shoulders of folks who have loved not just Christian brothers and sisters, but those outside of the family of faith. And by God, we're not gonna stop now. And continue to love people and value them in an extraordinary way, knowing that every person who walks through these doors, and, and check it out, people who never will walk through those doors, know that they are valuable in the eyes of God. I wanna tell you one quick story to close because I think it's important in terms of personal application and how you can put this value to work in your own life. Uh, and it comes from, actually, I was, uh, last night, Amy was, was out with some friends, and uh, I was uh, reading fake news on CNN.com. I love fake news. It's a lot of fun. And there was a story on CNN.com of an individual named Kevin Hines, 
who attempted to take his own life September 25th, 2000. Uh, when I, some of you may have read the story actually, uh, Kevin Hines is actually a proponent of mental health issues now and uh, suicide prevention. And the way he attempted to take his own life was he climbed up on top of the Golden Gate Bridge and jumped off. Uh, broke his spine in multiple places, broke his ribs in multiple places, mass internal bleeding. There's been about 1,300 people try to take their own life by jumping over off the Golden Gate Bridge since its inception, since it was built, and about 40 have survived. He was one of the lucky ones. Uh, Kevin Hines, the interesting part is that uh, after the fact, having survived, he tells the story of the day he attempted suicide. He made a deal with himself that if I walk up onto the Golden Gate Bridge and I sit for a while, if somebody shows me kindness, I won't do it. And so the interviewer said, what do you mean by kindness? He said, just if somebody looks me in the eye, somebody gives me a little head nod, you know the old head nod, yep, head nod. Sometimes for younger people, it's this way. Right? <laughs> it's a head nod either way. If somebody smiles, eye contact, anything. He said, I sat for two hours and I got nothing. And so I kept the deal with myself and I jumped off. Here's one way, one way, men and women of God, you can put this value into practice today. It's real simple. Ready? Just say hello. Just say hello. It's easy. It's not complicated. God may be calling you to something bigger and greater and farther reaching and you know institutions and organizations and all that stuff, but you can make a difference in somebody's life today just by saying hello, and guess what? You never know. You never know what deal they may have made with themselves. You never know how they might be feeling about themselves. You never know what their intention might be. And just you walking over to them and going, hello, might change the course of human history. Might change it just for them, just by acknowledging that they are valuable in the eyes of God. Hello, 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 hello. Even if you're into brevity, hi. Hi. Just one syllable. Men and women of God, it's a very simple application of a very rich and very divine principle that everybody is somebody in the eyes of God. This is how Babe You Glen Church will live. Let's pray. God, thank you for your presence with us today. Thank you for this great cloud of witnesses that have come before us who inspire us to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles and run the race with perseverance that is marked out for us. Remind us, oh God, of that race so that everyone everywhere would know your extraordinary love and the created purpose you have for them through Jesus. Remind us of that mission today, oh God, is not Bible knowledge or even knowing some other Christian people and we call it fellowship or whatever, but that mission is carrying the good news about Jesus to each and every person who has never heard it, never felt it, never known it, never experienced it. And it doesn't start with ministry programs, it doesn't start with this even that we're doing, God, it starts when we begin to value each individual that we know we will never lock eyes with an individual who doesn't matter to you. And God, you have demonstrated the ways in which you value each individual by sending your son Jesus into the world to say, this is how much you're worth to me. You're worth my son to me. Teach us, oh God, to live out that Jesus value just as the church has endeavored to do, not been perfect, but endeavored to do for the last 2,000 years, that everybody's somebody. God, we love you. And we sing now even a prayer of commitment and dedication. We will build our life on your love and now lead us in your love to those around us just with a simple hello. In Christ's name, God's people said, amen.